A Glance in the Mirror Chapter 23 Winning the War From the time Bert joined the Home Guard to the time he was demobilised, the family saw little of him. Fortunately, they were never long enough to change the way Elsie ran the home. She continued her placid way of life. Nothing hurried, no upsets, no acceptance there was a war on, or that rationing should dictate the type of meals eaten. Elsie treated her sons exactly how her mother had behaved. She was quite content if they took themselves off, not to return until much later in the day, to have their tea. She was quite happy tending her garden, or contentedly sitting down to knit whilst listening to the radio. Terry enjoyed school life and his classmates, but most of all his particular friend David. Their childish conversations were taken up by the history of the Plantagenet kings, their castles, and the breaching of their walls. Class lessons were not onerous except mental arithmetic, problems, especially those awful problems if you bought six apples at tuppence each and four pairs at one penny, how much would you have left out of a ten shilling note, were horrific. He always forgot the beginning of the question. All children were taught to read and write in a manner laid down by the education authorities. Conversational English was based on the language of the radio announcers, the King's English. Sums were a compulsory part of the curriculum, as was scripture, music, nature lessons and model making. Every year had its sports and empire day, dancing round the maypole, cricket and football, when the field was dry, which seemed to be rare. It was a good school, although unfortunately it coincided with the war, which interrupted most lessons. Sex reared its head in a very innocent way, with I'll show you mine if you'll show me yours, which never to my memory produced anything other than mild amazement. Saturday morning cinema, either at the Granada Cinema Harrow, the Odeon Rainers Lane or the Embassy North Harrow, had all their own theme songs, which the children sang loudly in time with a spot which indicated on the screen the next word. Their special clubs, which passed out badges of membership, were much prized. The cinema club's theme songs promoted tense excitement. Westerns with Roy Rogers taking the lead. Detective Mistress with Mr. Ching. The Bowery Boys, who were led by Slip Mahoney. Laurel and Hardy comedies. Charlie Chaplin slapstick humour. And the Keystone Cops' mad antics were the most frequent comedies. There was the usual competition for small boys to try and get to the front by crawling under the seats to get nearer the screen. On special occasions, live actors and singers gave a concert during the middle of the show. The organ at the Granada would rise out of the floor and a white-coated figure would strike up the tune to a roar from the whole audience. A tuppenny round lion's ice cream cornet was a particular delight. Although Terry never took part, there was always wild crazies going round the school. Either it was cigarette cards collecting a particular coloured or sized marble to swap, flicking cigarette cards against the wall to see who got the nearest to the wall or covered the other's cards. There were gangs of boys playing knock-down ginger who leapt on each other's backs to see if they could get higher than the other team. Girls screamed, playing catch, juggling the balls, skipping or playing hopscotch. Boys playing football with a tennis ball or just riding on each other's backs to see who could knock a another pair over. Groups playing the farmers in his den, five stones, marbles or cat's cradle. However, the greatest collectors were those who could produce the largest piece of shrapnel. Stan had joined the Cub Scouts the year before. Now it was Terry's turn. Albert took him to the scout shop in Hines Road, Harrow, where he was kitted out with neckchief, woggle, cap and jumper in the headstone colours. Tags and badges brought home to be sewn on by my mother. My life as a cub began 
we learned our scouts promised how to salute and about the scouts good deed of the day sat for badges fire lighting telling the time and tying up shoelaces learning special recitations and packing the kit bag for summer camp the high point of the year one of terrier's regrets was that he was never able to swim a whole group of the us would go to the swimming baths in harrow there the group played tennis team games in the water and because terry couldn't swim he pretended by hopping about on one leg it was awful not being able to join in properly although having to experience the war it was exciting a great talking point nothing frightened the children the blitz over london was visible and the searchlights lit up our bedroom and the akak dunk guns pumped their shells into the sky shrapnel rained down and could be heard bouncing on the roof still it all seemed a long way away bombs did fall on pinner in the summer of nineteen forty and some close to st alban's church a number in the centre of pinner later that year all these were over quickly and soon forgotten the v for vengeance bomb or doodle bug was a jet engine powered stubby winged plane operating from a ramp which gave flight direction the distance controlled by the amount of fuel it carried this was the first of hitler's vengeance weapons the second was the v two rocket and the third an enormously long barreled gun all three were random weapons used for scare tactics rather than pinpoint accuracy the v one had an engine noise which was distinct had a sort of spluttering sound everything was all right whilst you could hear the engine running but when it stopped you knew that the plane was about to dive in a steep uh, dive to the ground three fell in the summer of nineteen forty four one in Parkside Way, another in Rowlands Avenue, and a third fell seven doors away between numbers 49 and 53 in Cumberland Road, also damaging the British restaurant and home guard hut. The doors and windows were blown in, and part of the roof collapsed. At least five houses were blown up, and many more damaged a number of neighbours died and another seriously injured this occurred when derrick was just under a year old when the war was in its final year stan and terry were getting ready for school after finishing breakfast father having just dressed into his uniform the family were milling about in the kitchen mum putting on terry's tie and stan was still sitting on the box seat it was a normal start to the school day and we were about to head for the front door there was a whooshing sound and then an explosion not an enormous bang but more of a rumble and a billow of billowing of plaster dust a sight quite unimpressive for the devastation it caused there had been no air raid sign sirens so that we had been taken completely by surprise elsie's cry of derrick activated the whole family who rushed for the hall and stairs up the family went into the grown-ups bedroom there was derrick smiling sitting in a sea of glass and dust it was amazing no harm had come to him a closer look at the room showed that the windows were blown in and most of the doors torn from their hinges a number of the neighbours had been killed and one lost his sight albert immediately headed down the road to see if he could offer any assistance and to organise the relief services whilst the family turned to to start to clear up the mess it was not long before workers came round to repair the damage and it was during this time that the floors were lifted and the void beneath filled with hardcore this to some extent cured the problem of damp many of the rotten joists were replaced and so too the damaged floorboards during the weekends it was terry's job to take derrick out in a pram they walked for miles mostly up to hall's farm to snow white's cottage which was just up the cart track off george the fifth avenue albert's spell in the home guard ended in nineteen forty four when it was clear to the government that hitler was not going to invade or land paratroopers on leaving his rank was made substantive he was now a major although not on the serving list he moved back to the railway which had two important effects for the family 
One was that each car had to be given back to the rightful owner, and two, life got back to the routine left behind four years previously. That Christmas the children thought the celebrations were even more splendid now that their father was at home all the time. The second front began on the 6th of June, shortly after his return to the railway. His task was to organise the massive amount of freight required for the invasion of France. All old antagonisms about the, his allegiances to a company not part of the Grand Central Railway were forgotten in the excitement of the occasion. The whole country pulled together to ensure the services had total ease of rail and road transport, and by the end of that year the Allies were at the German border. Five months later Hitler was dead, and the Germans surrendered unconditionally. It took until August for victory over Japan to be announced. Albert treated Christmas as a reason to be expensive. He loved all of it. The hanging of paper chains, bells and balls, decorating the, decorating the front and back rooms to Father Christmas's grotto. Copper, three penny pieces with greaseproof paper added to the mi pudding mix, if silver ones not available. The pudding cloth lay over the pudding, the string tied round the basin, and the ends of the cloth knotted over all. The pre-Christmas preparations could be completed well in advance. Everyone hoped for snow to give a special atmosphere of comfort and togetherness. Presents were gathered and spread round the bottom of the Christmas tree. Pillowcases hung on the stairs to receive masses of sing simple presents. Stockings were hung on the bottom, bottom rail of the beds. The sideboard groaned under dishes of fruit, boxes of dates and chocolates. The front room table lay with an immaculate iron cloth and set using the best china and cutlery. It was Terry's job to queue up at the express dairy to get what cakes and sponges were available. The highlight was my father playing all the old tunes with everyone singing along. Song seats were distributed, cut out of the newspaper, especially for the occasion. The blue-covered Daily Express songbook had its annual exposure to daylight. Mum and Nan would fuss about the kitchen stove and sink and, uh, since early morning, for nothing was spared to give everyone the best. Crackers arranged by every placing. All had to wear one of their paper hats. Jokes were read out and miniature fireworks set off. English sherry consumed whilst the nuts were passed round. The fire was banked up to produce sparks that would fly up the chimney and everyone would draw back from the heat. The King's message was eagerly looked forward to whilst the port and mince pies circulated. Victory in Europe, VE Day, was in May 1945. Terry was almost ten years old in his penultimate year at junior school. And he doesn't remember that, uh, any particular fuss about the ending of the war. They had to street, no street party or buntings flown, although the local church bell did ring. War was still being waged in the Far East, and there were still many shortages. Ration books were still in use right into the 50s. The aftermath of the war brought about massive social changes. The numbers of women doing men's work, and in many cases better, were obviously going to be uh, to create diversions. This accelerated the change of order. There was no going back now. Women's liberation caught the mood. The media and all entertainment sources declared the moment. The Labour Party began improving and extending social services, creating the welfare state, nationalism, education and national he health acts gave rise to countryside feeling that the country was going to be a socialist state, that all men would cooperate to make an even more even society. It was not to be. There was a debt to pay ice to scrape off the rails, and another war to fight. Bricklayers and chippies were desperately needed 
to repair and reconstruct the damaged homes and factories. Most major southern cities in Europe were war-torn and ravaged with many levelled bomb sites. The houses in Cumberland Road, blown up by the flying bomb, were rebuilt, keeping to the previous design. The damaged houses were repaired using number 31, the void and the floor filled in and the rotten floorboards replaced. The men doing the work were only using hand tools, adopting standards that were mainly pre-war, mixing up plaster with horsehair and cement by hand. Looking back at that time, it was a difficult time for Albert to adjust and the family fortunes were at low ebb. There was not so much in monetary terms, although that was hard, but in my parents' social well-being, the age difference between my parents began to become more obvious. Their appreciation of the latest industrial advances and current changes in social behaviour became more distant. There had been little change in social behaviour and working environment since the twenties. Now, under thrusting new workforce, looking for change and a greater distribution of wealth, everything associated with the past was being challenged. The 11 plus examination was brought into being by the 1944 Education Act. This was a system of secondary education made to fill the number of grammar school places then available. In some counties, the child who failed this 11 plus exam could reset the following year. For those who failed, there was the chance to sit for a technical or art school, both for boys or girls wishing to be tradespeople, and sat at the age of 12. Girls tended to go on to take secretarial courses or catering colleges and boys went into engineering and commerce. Those children who failed both these exams and were not in O-level streams within the secondary modern school system became an underclass of poor achievers. They could re-enter the higher educational system by applying for polytechnic places. This was not its intention to make young people feel of less importance, but a fact. Terry was one of those who felt belittled by failing these tests. In this, I am not necessarily blaming the system, for there must be a hierarchy of learning with a place on the scale for technical and manual ability. There were so few places in so few schools. The numbers which passed obviously corresponded to the numbers of places available. Those that passed were the exception. Perhaps there were just half a dozen in a class of 35. The grammar schools, particularly the most well-known like Harrow, took the elite, and they were known to be quite as good as the next private fee-paying school. There was a feeling at the time that th this was a fair system for pro progressing bright pupils. Those that failed could have a second chance at taking the 12 plus and after a year one could sit the entrance exam for a technical school. The thought that if you were not clever using your head you might be clever at your using your hands and then go on to engineering, building or art school. It believed that children had aptitudes, if not to standard uh, at one subject, then better in another. There's no doubt that there were some parents who did seriously think about how best to place themselves and their children to take advantage of the system. They might be social climbers or even show-offs. Their concern and interest rubbed off on the children who took study and homework as necessary, not as a chore. No matter the reason behind their motivation, the parents recognised that an effort had to be made to direct their children into good habits. Passing the 11 plus did not necessarily guarantee a secure job or an ability to earn more money than those who didn't. That the grammar schools gave a better education is not in any doubt, for they most certainly did. Certain secondary modern schools or comprehensive schools later on failed to reach the educational heights of the old established grammar schools. Breaking up that system by Shirley Williams and the Labour government was understandable but doomed to failure.
they would have been wise to have built up the then existing grammar school system, increased the numbers of places whilst reducing class sizes in the secondary modern schools, giving them a chance to improve their, sta their students' grades. The result of secondary education for most children in 1950 was a modest improvement compared to the 1930s. It was, if anything, a limited implementation of the 1944 Act. Even five years later, only twice as many stayed on at school to 17 than in 1940. What was lacking was a long look at the future by both the Labour and Conservative parties. Overseas countries were adopt, adopting, fa uh, adapting faster to new technologies. The secondary school headmaster, Mr. H. E. Man Manson, was a short, stout, red-faced man with swept-back, slicked-down hair in a pin-striped, pin-neat suit with a projecting white handkerchief from his top pocket. He stood at the school gates in the morning, rocking on his toes, alert to every living thing, whilst fluffing out his feathers. The light reflected off his spectacles like the yellow orbital rings of a peregrine's eye, scrutinising its territory. He patrolled the corridors during the day, catching his prey on the wing, alive to every trick played by his charges, stopping here then there to look in through the windows of the closed classroom doors to see if there's any larking about. Not only did the pupils fear him, but the teachers did too. Morning assembly saw he and the whole school gathered together, including the teachers, a respectful mass of upturned faces ready to take part in the daily service before the start of lessons. Achieving this army of serried ranks was a thing of organisational beauty. At the command of a whistle, the playing children would stand still. Another ear-shattering blast would direct all to form up by class, in twos. A third whistle started the leading class to file into the school along the corridor to the hall. Joining the first Pinner Boys Brigade Company based at Pinner Methodist Church Love Lane in 1946 was the highlight of young Terry's life, an opportunity for connecting which continued until he was 17. Captain Leslie White formed the company just after the war, and Terry went to gym classes, drill lessons, band nights, drill nights and church parades. He attended the camp and sat in numerous badges. It was more stimulating than school, giving security, interest, hobbies, friends and social skills. His great friend David was with him throughout all his school and boys' brigade days, from the age of five until eighteen. They went to Lord's Cricket Ground every Sunday afternoon in summer, went to the park at Headstone Recre Recreation Ground to watch the cricket and take the scores, camped out on Shorleywood Common in leaky tents and walked back from church after visiting the tea shop from Northwood to North Harrow every weekend. Forever discussing the war, the history of England, castles, their upkeep, defences and sieges. Every year the first Pinner Company spent a week camping at St Helens in the Isle of Wight. When they were there, the island ran a railway service all round the island. The train, built smaller than normal, started off from the Ride Pier, where the paddle steamers tied up, after their run from Portsmouth. We arrived at Ride Station from Waterloo Station wearing our uniforms throughout the whole journey, which made us very self-conscious. Still, we made a brave sight, marching up from St Helens Station with the bugle band in front led by Captain White to arrive at the field. This venue was the same every year. The cookhouse was staffed by professional cooks whilst we boys had to peel the potatoes and do the washing up. Every day there was kit inspections and the bell tents, flaps and brailings railed up, made ready for rounds. The Union Jack rose to the bugle call, blankets folded in true pusser fashion and kits neatly laid out on ground sheets. 
palliasses were stuffed with straw and tents carefully swept out for woe betide any dropped points for that meant not winning the trophy for best quad. It's difficult now to describe what all this meant to the boys and how seriously they took it. An inordinate time was spent cleaning the equipment, the tent and the site. The tent lines had to be exact and so too the kit for inspection. The bugle call perfectly played and the Union flag rose with ceremony and pride. Prayer said every day and church parades an essential part of the week's proceedings. Every squad had to perform a special task and to provide part of the week's concert party. A trip to Sandown was always high on the list of places to go. The boys piled out of the train to see what fun they could have. There was clock golf, crazy golf. Who could make the best sand castle and who could skim the water with a stone to see who had bounced the most? None of these came up to starting the day off with a hot jam doughnut. These doughnuts were then, and to my mind now, the very best that there had ever been cooked. Perhaps it was the dough, the amount of jam or the mass of sugar that the enticing doughnuts were rolled in. The round the island coach trip was another exciting event. Allen Bay, Black Gang Chine, Shanklin and Ventnor all were wonderful memories. Granny Smith apples have never tasted the same since, nor the grass of brown ale bought in St. Helens for sixpence. <laughs>